I think that still we've, we've just remained to be this sort of like positive force. I find that that unity is what makes Portland really special. You almost don't have to try that hard <laughs> to be considered like uh, the cool thing that's happening. And I think that's good and it's bad. It's kind of dangerous to fetishize the Portland local music scene as being somehow superior to others because that makes you feel like you're incapable of doing that in your own town. And we always encourage uh, people to build their own communities in their own cities. Hi, I'm Shayla and welcome back to Don't Move Here. In this episode, we're focusing on Mississippi Avenue, a business district that's gone through some pretty profound changes in the past couple years. First, we'll head over to Mississippi Records and Repair. Then we'll meet with local businessman, Paul Knowles. We'll stop in at Mississippi Studios and talk with Alicia Rose. And we'll finish things up with Tom Greenwood and his band, Jackie O Motherfucker. I'm here with Karen Antunes at Mississippi Records and Repair. Karen, how did the shop get started? When the record store first opened, it was um, Eric and Orion who started it. And Eric was a little nervous about doing the record store, so Orion decided to help out with doing repairs for turntables and equipment. So we have tons of turntables, and now we have a friend named Aaron who helps out, and he has a little workstation in the basement, and he does all the repairs. I think everyone who's involved with the shop um, really cares about what records we have, so it's sort of like our favorite reggae records or our favorite Brazilian records or our favorite soul records. Um, and we have punk and modern and rock music and lots of jazz um, and music from around the world, lots of blues and tapes, records and tapes. And Mississippi is a very particular record store, like it's cash only and there's a lot of just really deliberate decisions. Well, the I guess the ethos of the place is um, love over money. Kind of the idea was to make a, a cool space for people in the neighborhood to come and hang out. People come in all the time and put stuff on hold for way too long and will partially pay for things and take them home and pay us later. And So I think we kind of, it's a give and take relationship with people who come in. It's not any sort of capitalistic endeavor to take money from folks. It's kind of like we help each other out, I think. I guess the underlying thing with the label, it's music that should be available or music that we think is interesting and should be available that um, has been kind of either overlooked or difficult to find or uh, recordings that have touched us in really amazing ways that if you try to find an original of it's like ridiculous to, to afford. I think Portland seems to have kind of a cyclical nature of its music and its clubs. Um, when I moved here, especially in this neighborhood, I think when I got off the bus, uh -huh. there most of these shops right here, it's kind of overwhelming to see all these new buildings and all these new faces. But I guess it's happening all over the country, so it's to, I'm at odds with myself about um, accepting that it's just this process that America is in, but also wanting to fight it because I feel like we're losing so much, um, so many stories in the process. It's just moving a little too fast for me. I'm here with Paul Knowles of Geneva's, but Paul actually is a really important part of Portland's history. Paul, you moved to Portland when, in 1963? 1963, Be July 4th. <laughs> oh, because you bought you bought the Cotton Club, yes. right? Yes, yes. It was already an established club, but they were in trouble. And uh, I came down to visit, and I could see they were in trouble, so I made an offer. And what kind of music did the Cotton Club host? R&B. We can go back to say that Etta James, Eddie James used to play there, the Whispers, they're famous now. If you came to Portland and you didn't come to the Cotton Club, you really hadn't been to Portland. All the artists that would play big shows downtown, after they finished their shows, they would come over to our place and that's where they would come over. Like the night Sammy Davis Jr. came over, got up and sang and 
did his little dance in those days they call it the boogaloo and with my little three-piece band and here he was downtown at a concert with uh, just loads of musicians probably 18 to 20 musicians in his band and what was the neighborhood like then the neighborhood was mostly industrial with a couple of houses across the street but it was industry small industry in that area what do you think about like how it's changed over the you know in the, the past especially five years, the Mississippi area has really changed a lot. Well, yes, the, the Mississippi area, the only thing I hate now is that I didn't buy the whole street up. You know, if I'd have bought the whole street on Mississippi, then I wouldn't be probably sitting here, I'd be in Hawaii today. But uh, that's the way it happens. Uh, they, they, they take an area, um, let it go down so far, everyone moves out and then the youngsters start coming in and then the businesses moved in to support them and pretty soon there's big loans and big buildings and new buildings and everything's new. I, I grew up uh, hanging out on this uh, block and this block was uh, basically was the black community back in the uh, 50s and 60s. They had certain areas that blacks could live. There was a dividing line that blacks couldn't go across. And then the dividing line was now it's called MLK. It used to be Union Avenue. I hear my daddy say, if I die. How long have you been on this street? Um, I've lived here for five years. How have you seen like this little neighborhood change over those five years? It seems like it's gone through a pretty radical change. It's definitely way more crowded with people. It used to be Mississippi Pizza and the light bulb store and um, you know the little grocery store. I'm here with Alicia Rose. She is um, the booker of Mississippi Studios and co-owner? Co -owner. Yeah. Mississippi Studios, before I had anything to do with it, um, was, was owned by Jim Brumberg. Jim and I are both musicians as well as other kinds of artists. And you know, we really wanted to build a neighborhood community driven oriented space that could showcase music in the way that we like to see it showcased, which is great sound, good vibes, delicious drinks, tasty snacks, and good peeps. We had a lot of our friends help us with this place, and it is literally, we call it a, a venue built by musicians, for musicians and music lovers. So can you talk a little about like uh, weirdness and bands, and specifically, can you talk about Jackie O, motherfucker? I've known Tom Greenwood forever, and I, I think he's, in a way, one of the stalwarts of the scene. He was playing music in Jackie O Motherfucker when I moved here in 1995. Well, I, I played in a lot of, like like I've said, I played in, in bands in, in high school. We learned covers. We started forming songs that sounded like uh, radio songs or popular songs. And I, I found out that by continuing to do that, in the performance, night after night, got really boring. When I moved to Portland, actually, we would deliberately get up on stage together, and it wasn't really improvising because we, it wasn't that intelligent. <laughs> for, for us, learning to improvise meant sucking a lot. It's almost like everybody has to get up there and perform sooner or later, you know? It's like a, almost a rite of passage being in a band in Portland. There's just such a, like, such a deep amount of uh, information that's just traded here. There's just so much more um, amazing support. Indie kids and punk kids and DIY obsessives and then also just slightly more together. Types. You know, they all moved here over the last 10 years, we know that. It's transformed. Every, every warehouse is a condo now. And it's worrisome to me, and sometimes I fantasize about the past, but you can't go back. 